So my name is Hanna Paulomäki and um, I have been working both for Helcom and then um, different um, NGOs working with um, oceans and uh, marine and sustainability issues. And uh, I was really happy when Ida asked me to join, join her here today because um, it's been now a while that I have been focusing only on uh, marine conservation and it was so nice to have this opportunity to talk about the marine protected areas once more and in particular with Ida since um, we have shared uh, quite a few moments in Helcom meetings during the past I don't even know how many years. So thank you for having me here and um, now we go. So why marine protected areas? Um, I wanted to start this presentation uh, with this beautiful quote from Sylvia Err that says, um, no water, no life, no blue, no green. Um, I think that this somehow summarizes and captures the importance of the ocean to us in such a wonderful way that when you start thinking about this, this is actually all you need to know about the ocean. But since um, I promised to talk about 15 to 20 minutes, I will go a little bit further than this. So the, um, there are three gigantic systems that are operating at the planetary scale that are, are regulating the state of the entire planet. And, the, and these three systems are also the kind that we know they are having tipping points that if we cross those over, we will be changing the entire planetary system. And these three big systems are the climate system, the ozone layer, and then the ocean. The ocean regulates the heat exchange between the atmosphere and the surface. They host a huge diversity of life, actually so huge that we know barely anything about it. Over 90% of the ocean species have not been classified and more than 80% of the ocean is unmapped and unexplored. This is actually quite amazing. I've also heard somebody saying that we know more about the, the dark side of the moon than we know about the ocean diversity. Um, oceans also regulate the flow of nutrients and they regulate the water cycle. And they actually also produce half of the oxygen that we breathe. And today the oceans are threatened by a number of human induced threats, climate change, overfishing, eutrophication, pollution from various sources, plastics, and so forth. And this all has pushed many of the ecosystems and the services the ocean provides us to the edge. So the ocean is enormously important to us. And uh, this importance has been acknowledged for, for quite some time already now. Here in this photo, um, you can see the first ever designated MPA that is a Tri Tortugas National Park in Florida. It was formed in 1935. And since that, there has been a really, really slow but steady increase in uh, MPA or Marine Protected Areas um, designation globally. And what MPAs actually are, there are many definitions on those and there are like number of types of different MPAs existing. But one well-known and quite well-accepted definition is offered by IUCN, and they say that a marine protected area is a clearly defined ge geographical space recognized, dedicated, and managed through legal or other effective means to achieve the long-term conservation of nature with associated ecosystem services and cultural values. And further on, the IUCN guidelines also defined that um, MPA should maintain essential ecological processes and life support systems, preserve genetic diversity, and ensure the sustainable utilization of species and ecosystems. Um, the marine protected areas are also associated with a number of benefits. And these include conservation of species, habitats, and ecosystems, uh, marine protected areas provide refuge for species threatened and or commercially exploited. 
they protect against human damage, like fishing, dredging, building, and so forth, if properly managed. And they help to build and maintain resilience of the ecosystems that then helps to buffer against big threats like the climate change. And they provide a refuge for commercial fish stocks to grow bigger and places where they can also reproduce better. And this in turn may lead into the so-called spillover effect, which means that there will be increased catches outside the MPA. And as you could see also from the IUC and definition for the marine protected area, the MPAs are not only about uh, protection of the species and habitats and ecosystems and those processes, it also has the um, human and societal dimension, which is also equally important to the, to the functioning of the MPA. So the benefits of MPAs include also benefits for us. They have scientific and educational benefits, and they sustain local economies, economies and businesses, which is hugely important in many parts of the world. So here is a short history of the um, international commitments of marine protection. The first MPA was formed in 1935, but uh, as you can see from, this, from these years on this slide, uh, it took a while for global community to get organized for international marine conservation agreements. And most of the major steps in uh, marine protection has happened during the 2000s, probably partly also because of the overall increase of the environmental um, air awareness. But, uh, but anyhow, the biggest steps have happened during the past 20 years. In 2002, the Johannesburg World Summit on Sustainable Development agreed to establish a representative networks of marine protected areas by 2012. And in 2003, the IUC and World Parks Congress recommended that um, such a representative network should cover at least 10% of the ocean. And in 2004, in Convention on Biological Diversity meeting, they uh, took this IUCN recommendation and set a global marine conservation target of 10% by 2012. And then in 2010, the um, Convention on Biological Diversity agreed on a strategic plan for biodiversity for years 2011 and 2020. And this um, uh, plan included the uh, quite famous IG targets, where this one specific target 11 was on marine conservation and marine protection. And that requested that 10% of coastal and marine areas are to be conserved by 2020 through effectively managed, ecologically representative and well-connected systems of protected areas. So in 2010, that was the first time when the uh, management aspect was brought into the um, agreement and as a uh, requirement for a well-functioning MPA network. And along the 2000s, it was not only the uh, policy work that advanced a lot, it was also um, scientific studies and scientific literature also grew a lot during the past, or has been growing a lot during the past 20 years. And in accordance with the, with the, um, with the latest scientific um, recommendations, in 2014, the IUCN World Parks Congress increased their recommendation from the original 10% or 30% of the ocean to be highly protected by 2030. And now we saw, and, and actually this is quite interesting that the IUCN World Parks Congress has been a quite influential and quite, quite important body in this whole um, MPA or the marine, marine, uh, marine protection in the sense that um, CPD seems to follow quite a lot their um, recommendations. And uh, last year, we were supposed to have the Convention on Biological Diversity 15th Conference of the Parties, COP11, but that was postponed to this year because of the coronavirus situation. So this meeting that was supposed to be held last year is now being held uh, this November. But uh, because they had all the meeting documents ready already last year, we know that the zero draft of this um, COP15 
includes this 30 by 30 target. So this has this has not been formally agreed yet, but um, it is expected that uh, this will be one of the outcomes of the meeting, fingers crossed. So this is kind of like, this now shows how the aspiration has evolved um, throughout the years and um, how much we actually have projected then this year, oh no, <laughs> to today. So today, 7.8% of the ocean is protected. And um, as you can see, this is quite far behind from the original um, aspiration of having 10% uh, covered first by 2012, then by 2020. And now we expect to have the goal to be set to 30 by 2030. But anyhow, the, the, so that the, the conservation is still lagging behind from the aspiration, there has been steady increase in the areas protected. But uh, less than 3% of the ocean is fully protected as no take marine reserves. So much work is still, still need to be, need to be done. So how does it look then in the Baltic Sea? This is kind of the sh short development of the Baltic Sea Marine Protected Areas Network. Because in addition to these um, international processes and commitments mentioned above, there are also specific regional Baltic level and also EU level commitments that are applying in the most of the Baltic Sea. And of course, these developments are not separate from the global processes and often these run uh, hand in hand and, and parallel. And one could even say that help, the HELCOM system of MPAs has been kind of the role model for many parts of the, of the world oceans in protection because um, HELCOM was a little bit ahead of the time. So the first set of um, coastal and marine Baltic Sea protected areas were established already in 1994 with 62 areas. And if I recall correct, correctly, these covered at that time roughly 3% of the Baltic Sea. And today, most of the HELCOM or, or the Baltic Sea MPAs are either HELCOM MPAs or belonging to the EU Natura 2000 network. So in 2007, the Baltic Sea Action Plan was set to have an ecologically coherent and well-managed network of Baltic Sea MPAs by 2010, covering 10% of the Baltic Sea. And um, as we know, this was, this was not uh, met. It was actually, it was not far behind, but anyhow, we didn't have 10% uh, coverage in 2010. But in 2014, the HELCOM MPA system was renewed. The goal to develop an ecologically coherent network of well-managed MPAs in the Baltic Sea, that was kept, but the deadline was moved by 2020. And then with the Natura 2000 sites, um, the, that is the main EU mechanism to establish MPAs. And that aim is to protect vulnerable habitats and species across their natural range in Europe and ensure that they are restored to or maintained at a favorable conservation status. And in 2020, a European Commission launched a biodiversity strategy that had a proposal to protect 30% of the EU sea areas with 10% strict protection. So apart from the, the uh, HELCOM MPAs and EU Natura 2000 sites, there are also other types of MPAs in the Baltic Sea. And I just want to quickly give you an overview of, of um, those as well. So there are Ramsar sites that are coastal wetlands of international importance designated to meet the commitments under Ramsar Convention. There are UNESCO biosphere reserves that aim to reconcile conservation of biodiversity with the, with the site's sustainable use. And emerald network sites that are designated under the Bern Convention. Those form an ecological network of areas of special conservation interest. And the EU member states have agreed that the Natura, 2, Natura 2000 network makes up the EU members' contribution to this network. And then on top of this, there are also national parks and other nationally protected areas that are uh, at, at least locally really important. So what is the status of the 
um, Baltic Sea Marine Protected Areas Network. So the Helcom MPAs cover around 12% of the sea today, and the joint Helcom MPA and Natura 2000 network cover around 17%. There are management plans in place for two thirds of the sites, though uh, has to be said that um, not all of these management plans cover the uh, entire marine protected area. They might cover just part of it, mostly the terrestrial part, and then leaving the marine nature totally unmanaged. But there is some sort of management plan existing and in place for two thirds of the sites. And fishing occurs for over two thirds of the marine MPAs in the Baltic Sea as well. And according to the um, information, Helcom has collected some of these areas are even heavily fished. So based on, based on this information and the assessments that um, Helcom has made, the network cannot be considered ecologically coherent or well managed as aspired by the Baltic Sea countries. So the deadline to, to build up such a network of marine protected areas that deadline passed last year across the original, well, the original deadline was 2010 and uh, later it was postponed to 2020. And now probably it is highly, highly likely that the new target will be the 30 by 30. So we can, <laughs> we need to keep working and we need to keep pushing that um, that will be, that, that target will be met. But how to do that? So there is a need, need for, for build a coherent network of protected and uh, well-managed areas in the, in the Baltic Sea. And I, I tried to summarize here like few, few points, few thoughts on what that would require in order that to, to happen. Well, first and foremost, there would, we would need effective management plans for all marine protected areas. The management plans and management measures are essential to achieve the conservation goals of both like the individual sites in the network, but also the network, the MPA network as a whole. And then there is also a need for harmonized measures in transboundary areas. There is need to have no take zones to protect uh, fish stocks and to preserve natural ecosystems. Uh, many of the fishing practices are highly destructive. And uh, as, as you might remember from the previous slides, uh, fishing is allowed on over two thirds of the MPAs in the Baltic Sea. And um, there is a lot of, uh, lot of scientific evidence and a growing body of literature showing that the benefits of this uh, strict form of protection actually overweights any of the costs that uh, such designation might, might uh, create. So in this sense, um, the, the knowledge and the information and the science is on the side of the no-take zone so that it is bene creating benefits also for, for human societies. And, and uh, yet this is something that has not, has not proceeded much during the, during the past uh, years. Then there is a need for increased connectivity of individual sites uh, via designating more sites into right places. And then also we would need to integrate MPAs into wider management of human activities at sea. The protection and resilience of biodiversity cannot be delivered via a network of uh, MPAs in isolation from the wider integrated um, marine management of, of human activities. And there is also need for additional measures on top of the uh, marine protected areas to protect the coastal and marine biodiversity, such as, um, for instance, species or habitats recovery programs. So the networks of MPA should be nested within a wider manage, marine management and um, planning system. And um, I, I think that this last point is probably the most important because like we, we need marine protected areas, we need to increase the coverage of MPAs, but even at best the MPAs can do only so, so much. 
they are not uh, magic silver bullets fixing it all so that when you protect a certain percentage of the sea, you are all set and then you can continue business as usual. We will need more and better integrated management, but in a way that the MPAs would form the core of such management. Because so far, all countries in the Baltic Sea region are failing to adequately provide the protection needed to sustain and restore productivity and resilience of the Baltic Sea. And this, of course, has its consequences on the wildlife and habitats but it actually bears a huge cost also for us by eroding the natural capital. Uh, Helcom has calculated that the improved state of the Baltic Sea would benefit us over 4 billion euros annually if the overall status was improved. So all this is actually underlying the importance of setting the priorities right, put the nature and its welfare at the center, and take action to address and solve the identified gaps in marine conservation. Thank you so much.